music's faded out, the conversation's faded out. Hello. <laughs> yeah, g'day, g'day, g'day. Uh, so Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. If you guys listened to the Bible apps devotionals the other day, it had this verse as the, the devotion, and it was sharing about how other religions look to the stars and like worship those things. But how much greater is it for us that we can worship the creator of those stars, the creator of all things? And so today, today we're going to start by singing together the love of the Father who loves us, uh, his creation. So it's a wonderful thing. So I'm going to encourage you guys to stand as we sing together. song that got introduced last week is probably a song that everyone's quite familiar with, How Great Thou Art. So we're going to continue singing with How Great Thou Art.
Great to be together, brothers and sisters. Uh, Welcome to church. Uh, How wonderful to remember uh, straight off the bat that we are the people of God, people of a great God who has redeemed us at the high cost of the, uh, the blood of his son. What a privilege to gather as God's people, as we do every Sunday. Uh, welcome to you. Welcome if you are new or visiting. It's a great privilege and joy that you are with us and trust that tonight is a great blessing to you as well. Uh, and friends, if you've been on uh, holidays, welcome back. I'm sorry that the holidays are over, but I hope you're feeling refreshed. And of course, so great to see the year 12s with us as well. Well done. Uh, Still gathering with God's people, even at this really kind of busy time of life. Uh, It's really good to be together, brothers and sisters. Now, uh, we're actually coming back to a part of God's word this term that we were looking at earlier in the year. We're diving back into the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, and we're going to be looking at the chunk from chapter 7 to 10, thinking about true freedom. Now, that's a a pretty loaded word, isn't it? Freedom. I wonder what you think of when you hear that word freedom. We're going to be discovering uh, true freedom is found in the Lord Jesus uh, and in life his way. And we're going to be thinking tonight, actually, about true freedom when it comes to sex and marriage. So I need to kind of flag up front, actually, that tonight's Bible reading, as well as the sermon, comes with an M rating. It is for mature audiences. And uh, but you guys are all here. So glad that you're all here. I really hope that uh, maybe it's going to trigger some uh, important conversations with parents on the way home if you're on the younger end of uh, the spectrum. But nonetheless, we're really delighted to hear God's word to us, uh, giving us a true picture of freedom when it comes to sex and marriage. So really looking forward to that. Um, But friends, as God has gathered us, as God's people together, uh, isn't it wonderful we get to connect with one another? We're going to spend a moment doing that right now. Um, And I I wonder, you might want to ask those around you as you uh, say g'day, if you haven't met them, what do you think of when you hear the word freedom? What is it that comes to mind? Let's turn and say g'day to those around. Uh, What do you think of when you think of freedom? Friends, uh, I should flag there's time uh, to continue those conversations as we share a meal after our time in here. We're going to be down the back um, outside enjoying a barbecue, so don't rush off. Um, And of course, later on, there'll be the opportunity to connect with the staff using the Engage page and touch base form. So please make use of that. But friends, uh, we get the great privilege as God's people to bring our needs and requests before our Heavenly Father, knowing that He hears us. 
uh, that he answers our prayers. Um, so we're going to have a time of prayer now. We're actually going to begin our time of prayer by praying a confession together. So the words are going to come up on the screen. I invite you to join me as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we fail to love you and serve you as we should. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace that we may continue to grow as members of Christ in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. And the scriptures promise those who confess that our sins are as far away as the east is from the west. So far has God removed our transgressions uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Such great news. So he's going to continue to lead us in a time of prayer. Please pray with me. Dear Lord and Father, we praise you for who you are. You are powerful and mighty and you are loving and compassionate. We thank you so much that in your love and compassion you sent Jesus to be our saviour. Help us to never take that for granted, but rather to live lives that honour you. Lord, we pray for Australians. We know that many, many people are saddened, even grieving, at the result of the referendum. We ask that there will not be a spirit of anger and bitterness in our country. We pray for peaceful and good decisions from our leaders, so that all will feel valued and all will have access to good health care and education and opportunities for employment. Please guide us, your people, as we navigate this post-referendum week. Help us to be good listeners and to be kind friends. May we be humble agents of your love and compassion. Father, it feels very heavy to us when we hear stories of the Israel-Gaza war. So much anger and violence and loss of innocent lives. It must grieve you too. We ask for peace in that land. Please, Lord, raise up leaders there who are compassionate and humane. Please comfort and strengthen those who have suffered great loss in both Israel and Palestine. Please, Lord, may the violence stop soon. It is hard, Lord, for us to understand the whole Israel situation, the long history of displacement and violence going way back to the Old Testament times. Um, no side in the current conflict seems good or right. In this unsettling time, we are so grateful to know that you are in control of all things and that Jesus offers salvation to all. We pray again that you will help Christians to be your agents of love and compassion. And Father, we pray now for Term 4 at Grace West. We ask that all the children's and youth ministries will run smoothly and that the leaders will be committed to sharing the truth of Jesus. We pray particularly that there will be enough leaders for kids' church at the morning services. We pray for the page one course that started today. May it be encouraging and helpful for the participants. May they feel well connected with our church. And we pray too that the additional staff member we are seeking will be found soon. Give our ministry team real unity and wisdom as they work together to see more and more people transformed by your grace. Give them the energy they need to serve you well. And we pray for each of us that we will seek to serve you well this week. May our lives bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We now come to a time of Bible reading, so if you'd open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 5, starting at verse 1, it can be found on page 514 of the Church Bibles. It's Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1. Proverbs 5, 1. My son... Pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. 
Her paths wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you lose your honour to others and your dignity to the one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich the house of another. At the end of your life you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. You will say, how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors, and I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. The second reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, can be found on page 927. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting at verse 1. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come again together so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Good evening. It's a beautiful night. We're looking for something dumb to do. Hey, baby. I think I want to marry you. Who knows the song? Who enjoys the song? Is it the look in your eyes or is it this dancing juice? Who cares, baby? I think I want to. Oh, thank you. We've got it now. The song is by Bruno Mars from 2010. It ran right up the charts and is still very popular at weddings. The, and the lyrics are so deep, I thought that we would say some of them together. So you're going to say these lyrics after me. You're going to repeat them. Are you ready? Don't say no, no, no. Just say yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And we'll go, go, go. go, go. If you're ready. ready. Like I'm ready. ready. Give yourselves a clap. That was so good. You've now got a song under your belt. But why do the best songs have the worst lyrics? That's always the case, isn't it? Good songs, well, good tunes have the worst lyrics. And this has got shocking lyrics, really, because it trivialises marriage. It really does make a mockery of marriage. So what is marriage meant for and how can we make sure that uh, we enjoy a truly satisfying marriage? That's what we come to in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The whole chapter, this huge chapter, it's all about marriage, Christian marriage. And we're only studying the first five verses tonight where we look at the good, the better, the best and the worst of marriage. Okay, so uh, we're not going through too much. So is anyone feeling tired tonight? Yep, a few people. Well, I don't think you'll fall asleep because it's all about sex. Okay. The first five verses anyway. But to grasp 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you really need to understand 1 Corinthians chapter 6, at least the end of it, particularly verse 19. We might have that on the screen. Verse 19, because that sets up the context for chapter 7. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price, then honour God with your bodies. See, we should honour God with our bodies because God owns us. He bought us. He made us in the first place, but he also bought us. He purchased us, right? But have a look at the price tag. What was the price tag? His one and only son who was flogged and beaten and nailed to a cross and buried He suffered all of that for us, to purchase us, to own us. And so we belong to him. And Christ not only bought us, but gave us his spirit. So we're not just lumps of meat. We're temples of the spirit. We're not just pounds of flesh, but temples of the spirit. So what's all that mean for our bodies? Well, we can't just do whatever we want, whatever we please, whatever we think is nice or whatever comes natural. We can't do that. Uh, Everything we do, we do to God, including what we do with our bodies. 
And so we should honor God with our body. We should glorify God in our body, especially when it comes to sex, because if anything else, sex is something we do with our bodies, right? So we're not to use our bodies for sinfulness, but for holiness. That's kind of like the headline for this chapter. We don't use our bodies for sinfulness, but for holiness. But that gave the Christians in Corinth a problem. If we're owned by Jesus, if we're temples of his spirit, if we're precious to God, then maybe sex is no good. Really, we should keep our souls for Jesus. We should wait till heaven because sex is, well, better to wait. That's what some of the Christians were thinking. Better not to have sex. Better not even to touch a man or a woman. They say in verse 1, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a man. or it's, it's, it's more spiritual not even to touch them, is what some of them were thinking. And that played itself out, that understanding played itself out in history. Oregon, he was a great theologian of the third, third century. He thought it was so bad he castrated himself. The monks in the 9th and 10th century, they hid themselves away in monasteries so as to avoid contact with women. And even Roman Catholic priests these days have to practice celibacy. And even a young couple in the church I attended thought it was not good to have sex at all, a married couple. They were living together but not doing anything because they didn't think it was right. So let's see what Paul says about marriage and sex. Please find 1 Corinthians 7. Read the first couple of verses with me. Now, for the matters you wrote about, grab a Bible or a device. Make sure you can follow on with this reading. Now, for the matters you wrote about, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Notice, it's quoted. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Okay, so now we're moving on to the second point. Paul is moving on from what is good on the screen to what is better. Point B, what is better. There's nothing wrong with having asexual relationships. They are right and proper because they're part and parcel of marriage. Okay, so this might be a surprise to come because society thinks that God says sex is kind of like it's kind of like dirty or it's, it's kind of like dark or maybe a, bit, maybe a bit devious. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. God isn't against sex. God is not anti-sex. He made it up. You know when he made Adam and Eve? Remember he created Adam and Eve? It's not as if he created Adam and Eve and turned, turned his back for five minutes and when he turned back around he saw them going for it and thought, Oh no, what are they up to? He invented it. God created sex. And since God created sex, God also designed sex, designed how it works or how it should work best. Each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. That's, get it, at home, with your spouse, within marriage. And notice here, each to his own. The word each is really important there. Each to his own, not several wives for each man, unlike the Muslims, unlike the Mormons, unlike the Mongolians. I don't know why they all start with M. <laughs> it must be a thing with M for marriage or something, I'm not sure, but they all practice polygamy. And that's not on in the Bible. Christmas, uh, Christian marriage is all about one spouse for life. That's God's design and he knows what's best because he made marriage. So choose a man to marry and you stick with him for life. Choose a woman to marry and you stick with her for life. That's how it goes. And make sure you enjoy a healthy, happy sexual marriage. That's what Paul is saying. First, because that's what marriage is for. That's what marriage is designed for. And secondly... To prevent a problem. To prevent infidelity. Right? Because some people, some were having sex outside the home because they were not getting it inside the home. So they were wandering. And um, <clears throat> it's not surprising, <clears throat> even in our day and age, that this is happening. 
In fact, of 11,000 couples, one survey said that sex was, uh, sexual immorality was happening at the rate of at least one in five, if not more, depending on where it was surveyed. But notice what Paul is not saying, namely, it's your fault if your spouse goes elsewhere. All sex outside of marriage is immoral and is the fault of the cheating partner. And yet, I think Paul is saying here, you don't want to give them an excuse, right? You don't want to kind of facilitate them to do that or enable them to do that in any way because if you shut up shop, then they might shop elsewhere. You get me? They might go elsewhere. Because it's easy to find, did you know that there are dozens of dating sites designed for people who are married and want to have an affair. Lots of dating sites for that. The most famous one being Ashley Madison, which, whose membership includes more than 60 million people across 53 countries of married people wanting to have an affair. And Paul would say, it shouldn't be happening. A healthy sex life will keep marriages together. Although modern ears don't really like to hear it that way because we're so dosed up on Hollywood and romance and we think, oh, isn't it romance that you get married because you're romantically in love and doesn't romance keep a marriage together? And I want to say there's nothing wrong with romance but faithfulness is better. Better a marriage without romance than without allegiance and loyalty. Better without romance than without allegiance. So... If you're ready for some very pointed lessons here, if you're having an affair, if you're married and having an affair, then stop. Stop. If you are having an affair, if you are toying with having an affair, stop. And if you are using porn as an alternative to having sex with your spouse within marriage, stop. That's not an alternative. Porn is cheap and a nasty alternative to the real thing that God designed. And never think that you can never stop looking at porn because you can. I spoke with a guy in church who conquered his addiction after battling with it for eight years. It doesn't matter how long you've been addicted. You can stop. And do not think, oh, look, I'll worry about that once I'm married. I'm single at the moment, so I don't have any alternative. Bad thinking, because I've spoken to men who continued to use porn into their marriage, and guess what? It started to ruin their marriage. And the sooner you stop, the better, the healthier, the happier you will be. Okay. Well, I said tonight should keep you awake. Has anybody fallen asleep yet? Okay, well, if they have, don't wake them up because the best part is yet to come. Having already looked at the good, the better, now we come to what's best, okay? What's the best marriage practice? Go to 1 Corinthians 7 again and this time check out verse 3. You see verse 3 there? And Paul is saying what's best. Verse 3, the husband should fulfil his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. And Paul is saying what's best when it comes to marriage, and it comes down to understanding your duty, your responsibility within the marriage. And one of the basic responsibilities is sex. One of the basic obligations, even the duties of marriage, is sex. Because sex is not just an optional extra for people, like choosing to celebrate Valentine's Day. Some people do it, some people don't. Who thinks Valentine's Day is a good idea? Generally, think... You know, like the idea of people celebrating it, some hands, some don't. That's fine. You know, it doesn't matter. And sex is not like that because sex is part and parcel of what marriage is about. Remember Genesis chapter 2, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become... No, not the two will become one. The two will become one flesh. One flesh, physically, bonded together, physically. Because marriage is leaving and cleaving bodily to your partner. But get this, not only is it your duty 
to provide sex. It's their right. It is your duty in marriage, it is your duty to provide it, and it is their right to receive it once you're married. That's what verse 4 is all about. Read on to verse 4 now. Check this one out. Check out this verse in your Bible. Have a look at verse 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband. And in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to his wife. So Paul's argument about sex being normal for married couples comes down to the issue of authority because in this department, you don't have authority over your body. Now, I know that's radical because our culture says the opposite. We've got some slogans up here. We've got the slide with some words on it about... See, there's bumper stickers on cars saying things like, your body, your right. Your body, your right. And posters like, you do you. And T-shirts like, don't touch, it's mine. Now, of course, I think those posters and T-shirts are terrific for people when they're young. Kids, teenagers, when you're growing up, you need to understand that you have a right over your own body. That's really important to get in the first place. Okay, there's a place for that, and young people need to learn self-worth and not to let, not to let people take advantage of them. That's really critical. But this chapter is about marriage because when you're married, you give up certain rights and one of the first rights that you surrender is the authority over your own body because now you're going to share it. You're sharing it with your partner, with your husband or your wife. And it does rub both ways, right? It goes for both parties. The wife yields her body to her husband and the husband yields his body to his wife. In other words, in marriage, there's no power imbalance. It's not like one has more power than the other. Marriage is a, is, is, it's a mutual surrender society, marriage. Both sides surrendering to each other. Because, you know, in marriage, when you get married, you want to get married? Well, in marriage, you take on a whole new perspective because no longer is it about you. It's not about you anymore. It's all about them. It's about them and their needs and their desires. In fact, this is the whole thing about the Christian life once you become a Christian. It's never about you anymore, but it's about other people because that's just like Jesus, what he did. He did not come to be served but to but to serve and to give his life for others. And that's really what Paul wants us to do within the marriage, to give our life for our partner. So here's the secret of a happy marriage. It's about serving and not subduing. It's about helping and not harming your partner. It's about giving and not taking from them. In every room of the house, particularly the bedroom, especially the bedroom. Having said that, does that mean you can never say no when it comes to sexual activity? Of course not. In fact, you must say no at times when you don't really want to or when you're not up to it, right? You, you, you need to say no. And it's wrong for somebody to insist on it when you are saying no. I remember Carol Council, a young married woman once who didn't feel like having sex at times, but felt compelled to by a husband who was putting her under pressure. And you know what the worst thing about it was? He was a Christian and he was using this verse to prove that she should do whatever he wants. (laughs) That's what I call twisting scripture. Because these verses are not saying that. A sexual encounter is a negotiated encounter. And if it's not negotiated, then it's not on. If it's not negotiated, then it's not happening. It's got to be agreed. Even our states, New South Wales, have worked out this one with laws coming in, into effect last June about consent being necessary in the sexual department. And isn't it good to know that after 200 years, our state has finally caught up with the Bible? Because the Bible's been saying this for 2,000 years. Consent in marriage. So let me say it aloud and clear for emphasis. In marriage, there's no place for forcefulness, only tenderness. There's no place for pushing, only serving. 
There's no place for compelling people or making your spouse do anything they don't want to do. In fact, do you know that taking sex from somebody without their consent is illegal now? You cannot do that. It's actually illegal taking something, even if it's from your married partner. It's called sexual abuse and is totally immoral and we stand against it as a Christian community here, okay? So if your partner says no, then you have to accept it and love them anyway because isn't love meant to be unconditional? Yeah? We're meant to love them all the time, no matter what? Well, it applies to this as well. By the way, there are many times in life when sex is just not practical anyway. I mean, what if you're sick? What if you're prenatal? What if you're postnatal? What if you're depressed? What if you're grieving or anxious? What if you're stressed or you're on shift work or you're doing overtime? In fact, I'm surprised that people have time to do anything any time. There are so many reasons or excuses not to. You've, you've got to understand that. And people who've been married for a while, they get it. <laughs> on many times, on many occasions, it's just not possible and we're not to feel guilty about those times or worse, Make your partner feel guilty because they can't comply. Right? Guilt is not a great way to get sex. I spoke to one lady whose husband pressured her into having sex every day. That marriage failed. What if you've got different sex drives? Is that possible? Can I just be a bit realistic for a minute? It happens with every couple. It's not odd. It's the most common factor in marriages, okay? You've got to expect it and you need to talk about that very quickly when you get married. Because you don't want to end up in a situation where one partner has to beg for sex or maybe even has to earn the right, the privilege to have sex with you in marriage. That's not how... Christian sex happens. Or the other partner is using it as a bargaining tool or a, some kind of a gambling chip to get you to do things. Right? The best sex is offered freely and received gratefully. The best sex offered freely and received gratefully. Well, having already looked at the good, the better, the best, we come now to the worst part of marriage or the way that some marriages work. Have a look at the last couple of verses now, 5 and 6, as we're getting towards the end now. The last couple of verses we're going to read, verses 5 and 6. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. If the best practice is to supply your partner's need, then the worst practice is to deny your partner's need for no good reason, he's talking about. Okay, That doesn't mean you can never have a break. In fact, you can abstain from sex if you meet certain conditions. First, it must be mutual and therefore agreed by both parties. Secondly, it must be for a time, meaning a short time. Not very long, a short time. Thirdly, it must be for a good reason, and he gives the example of prayer. And then fourthly, you need to come back together very quickly. That's the fourth one. Okay, they're the conditions if, you know, sex is so important within marriage that he's very careful to stipulate what the conditions are if you're not going to do it. Mutual choice, limited time, specific purpose, and then quickly get back to it. Okay? Why? Lest one of you start looking elsewhere for it. Because if you deny your partner sex for a few days, it may not matter, but a few weeks, it could, and a few months, you're asking for trouble. So you get the impression here that Paul is very cautious. So... So make it the exception rather than the rule. Let me conclude with a caution and an encouragement, really, because I realise here that we are speaking to people from all sorts of different backgrounds and experiences and assumptions, and I might have touched on some very raw issues here, and I'm sorry if it's stirred up things for you. Uh, we don't do that deliberately, but you know, when you preach the Bible, that can happen. And we want to know that we're here to help. We really want to help people with every area of life, particularly this one. So if this has stirred up some issues, then please you know, get in contact with, with us, one of the staff members, 
And uh, if we can't help, we'll put you on to people who can. We've got the name of a very good counsellor who talks to people all the time about this sort of stuff and can help you deal with it. So if you are disturbed by something you've heard, then reach out because we've got some resources. We're going to put them up on the screen later so you can take notice of them as well. But let's finish on a positive note on how kind is Jesus for this teaching? It's fantastic, really. These standards on marriage are beautiful, especially when you compare them to what the world is offering, right? You know, nowadays, two-thirds of people cohabitate before they marry. They live together before they get married. Why? Oh, because we've got a better chance of staying together. You know what the statistics say? You've got a higher chance of having a failed marriage if you live together beforehand. Well, why would that be? Because God knows what is best. Do it God's way. Much better off doing it God's way. Trust God in this area. And uh, it will prevent some of society's biggest scourges. So we need to say to the world, you go your own way because we'd rather have Jesus' values any day. It's about holiness, not singleness. It's about them, not me. It's about serving, not subduing. It's about helping rather than harming. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ and his standards for us as his children, but particularly in the area of marriage and sex. And we thank you for this beautiful teaching. It's so healthy, so positive, so constructive. Help us to believe in Jesus' way and to follow him rather than the bankrupt ways of the world and the corrupt ways of the society around us. Help us to strive for holiness, not sinfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to respond in song, singing um, Before the Throne of God Above. Uh, so I'm going to encourage you to stand as we sing and respond.
please grab a seat. Well, friends, uh, it's now time to uh, bring up the Engage page. Let me encourage you to grab out your device so you can scan the QR code. Head to gracewest.church forward slash engage. Let me encourage you all to do that now so that you can head to the Engage page and then you can also respond uh, in the various ways uh, as things are happening tonight that I share with you. Um, first, of course, is the touch base form. Um, if you're new, if you're visiting, if you don't yet get a name tag, please fill in a touch base form. You'll grab a name tag for you. That'd be great. But of course, tonight, things might have been raised for you that you might like to have a conversation uh, with someone about. Um, please do use the touch base form as well uh, that the staff can be in contact with you. Um, as Steve mentioned, we'd love uh, to be able to help out um, and have those conversations. So if that's an appropriate way for you to have uh, in, in to gate that conversation, please make use of the touch base form. That'd be really helpful. Uh, I should flag as well, though, uh, in a moment when we share in a meal downstairs at 7.45, there'll also be a chance for some Q&A. Um, that might be if you just have some questions about the text, if you want to find out more, make sense of the, the Christian sexual ethic, um, that's a place for you to do that. That's happening um, in a little bit. Um, but also what is coming up uh, in a little bit uh, for our church, in a couple of Wednesdays time, the life course is happening again. And if you don't know, the life course is uh, for people to find out more about Jesus, to make sense of who he is, uh, what it means to follow him, uh, what he has done for us. Um, but it's not just for you to go, hey, friend, family member, you should come to this. It's for you to go, hey, friend, family member, Come with me, let's head to the life course so that we can find out more about Jesus. So if that's you, we'd love you to come along. If you have a friend that you know would be willing to come along, we'd love for you to register for that. Again, on the Engage page, click on that tab, you'll be able to register for the life course. Starting in two Wednesdays time, Wednesday mornings over at Silverdale, uh, Wednesday evening here at Glenmore Park. So that's the 25th of October is when it's kicking off. Um, the other thing, just to flag for you next Sunday across our services here at Glenmore Park, we'll be sharing in the Lord's Supper together. And we just like to, to flag that up front because the scriptures tell us to take it seriously. It's a fellowship meal, a meal that expresses both our trust in the Lord Jesus and our unity with our brothers and sisters. And so if there's conversations that need to happen, um, then please this week take that opportunity to reconcile with people that we can in good conscience share in that meal together next Sunday as we'll be doing. Um, and as I said, one last thing, um, we will be having a chance for some Q&A uh, downstairs in the little room down there uh, as we have some food together. So yeah, come along with your questions or just come along if you want to listen in uh, to other people ask their questions. Uh, because friends, whilst we've, uh, we're looking forward to a meal together, we've also uh, been given a feast of God's word tonight. And I hope it's been really helpful actually to hear a really robust picture of the Christian view of sex and marriage. Uh, so helpful as we've heard tonight that we're to use our bodies not for sinfulness, but holiness. Uh, we've heard tonight that sex is actually part and parcel of marriage, uh, and that in marriage, uh, in, uh, as we share in sex, it's the giving of self because marriage is not about you. That's what we remember. But of course, all of this is grounded uh, in um, the words uh, of the Lord Jesus to us in 1 Corinthians uh, 6, reminding us who we are and why that is the case. Listen to, to verse 19 again. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. We're going to encourage one another to do just that as we continue in our uh, conversations over a meal uh, happening, as I said, down the back. Um, so please do stick around for that. Uh, but I'll also just flag that as we do make our way out, um, as we connect, we're just going to put a slide up that Steve mentioned a couple of things that might be some resources for you, and uh, we just want them available for you to take in if you'd like to uh, head to that website, if there's books that you'd like to read, um, or if there's someone that you want to talk to in terms of a counsellor, that's someone that we recommend. But I'm going to give thanks for our food and our time together. Um, so let me pray for us. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you that you provide all that we have and that you've given us uh, all that we have for our enjoyment. 
Um, Father God, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for your word to us. And we thank you, Father, for the food that we're about to enjoy. And we ask that this uh, time and this meal uh, will strengthen us, that our conversations will build one another, and that we will be uh, being transformed more and more like Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So don't rush off. If you've got questions, you might want to write them down. Q&A will be happening later. But otherwise, let's go and enjoy a meal. I'll see you up the back.